IP addressing is broken into three different sections. First, this section, IP addressing introduction, we'll talk about some general guidelines in setting up our IP addressing. Then in the second section, IP addressing, we'll go into a detailed view of IP addressing. And then finally, we'll have a summary which reviews a number of these topics about IP addressing. In this section, we'll talk about the three key addresses, the IP address, the subnet mask, and default gateway. We'll talk about what physical segments are. We'll talk about entering IP addresses. We'll also talk about IP addressing modes and acquiring IP addresses. Each device on the network that uses TCP IP to communicate needs at least one unique IP address. Now that device could be a computer, sometimes we call these devices host, but it doesn't matter if it's a big computer like a mainframe or a small computer like a PC, it will need one unique IP address per network interface card. Routers also need IP addresses, generally they may take more than one IP address. Each connection or port on the router would have a unique IP address. And then printers and other devices would have IP addresses. An important thing to remember is that each IP address contains both a network ID and a host ID. Now the network ID is shared between all computers or all TCP IP devices on the same physical segment. We'll talk about what a physical segment is coming up. And then each device or each host has a unique host ID. Now I've listed out a example IP address here 152.107.1027 now part of that is a network ID part is the host. We're not going to say which is which just yet but we'll cover that very soon. The subnet mask is an address that accompanies the IP address and it indicates which portion of the IP address is the network ID and which portion of the IP address is the host ID. Now exactly how it does that is a little bit involved and we'll cover that in detail in a later section. It's important to realize that the IP address and subnet mask are interrelated and each only has meaning in the context of the other. Now the IP address and subnet mask are the minimum addressing requirements. If any computer or any device on the network wants to communicate using TCP IP they must at a minimum have the IP address and subnet mask configured. Now, if you just have the IP address and subnet mask configured, you can communicate to hosts on your same physical segment. This is what we call communication locally. The third address we may configure on our TCP IP hosts or devices is the default gateway. Now, the default gateway address gives us remote access. Now, remote access is being able to communicate with hosts outside our own physical segment. Now the default gateway address is really the IP address of the router on our same physical segment. Now if there's more than one router on our physical segment, we will configure the default gateway with the IP address of the router that is closest to the resources we will most, most commonly access. Now without a default gateway it is still possible to communicate remotely, but we would need a entry in our route table for each remote network. Now that's not commonly done more commonly we configure each TCP IP device or host with a default gateway. One key piece of terminology we must be familiar with is what is a physical segment? Now a physical segment can be thought of a broadcast domain. Now when we talk about a broadcast domain we're talking about a portion of the network or all devices that can exchange information using a broadcast packet. Now, if two devices are separated by a repeater, a bridge, or a switch, they are considered in the same broadcast domain because these devices will forward broadcast. However, if we have a router, a router will not forward broadcast, and they really define our physical segments. So our definition of what is a physical segment? Well, it's everything out one port of a router or between two routers, and that's again because a router does not forward a broadcast. Now this is important because of our IP addressing rules. Remember, all devices on the same physical segment share a common network ID. So that means all devices out one port of a router or between two routers would be on the same physical segment and therefore they would have a the very same network ID. Now of course they'll have a unique host ID to give them a unique IP address, but they all share a common network ID. Also, each physical segment has a unique network ID. So if we have a router with three different ports, that would give us three physical segments, and each physical segment would have a unique network ID, keeping in mind that all devices on each of those physical, physical segments would share the common network ID for that physical segment. 
every TCP IP device needs IP addressing information. Now that will always be an IP address, it will always be a subnet mask, and in most cases it will be a default gateway. Now these addresses are entered as part of the TCP IP software, and they can be configured one of two ways, statically or automatic. Now statically configured are addresses are when the administrator goes to the device and types in the IP addresses. And this is typically done for devices like routers, servers, maybe even printers. Because if we statically configure the IP addresses, we know those addresses will never change. Now there's another way to configure IP addresses and that's with a thing like the DHCP server. Now the DHCP server will automatically hand out the IP address to different TCP IP devices and this is perfect in the case of client computers because with DHCP there is some situations in which the IP addresses could change from session to session and that's fine with client computers but we don't want that to happen with our routers or printers or servers or key networking devices so the routers and servers we statically configure the client computers will probably use something like DHCP servers because DHCP servers make it easier to address our networks and cuts down on the number of errors. Address our networks and cuts down on the number of errors. When it comes time to choosing the IP addresses you're going to use to address your IP network with, you can either choose public addressing or private addressing. With public addressing, what you do is you receive IP addresses that are assigned and registered on the internet. Now with registered or public addresses you can connect your network directly to the internet. Now in the past an organization called the InterNIC kept track of the IP addresses and assigned them to companies. Now today the organization is Aaron and what they do is they are in charge of all the IP addresses. They assign them to the internet service providers and now the internet service providers will assign them to companies. Now the other way to address your network is to address it privately. Now if you address your network privately what you do is you use a non-registered set of IP addresses. Now the IP addresses that are available for use for private networking are specified in RFC 1918. They're a network address like 10.0.0.0. These addresses, like 10.0.0.0, are considered the non-routable addresses. That means they're not valid in any of the routers on the internet. So you cannot connect your network, if it's address, with 10.0.0.0 or any of the other private addresses directly to the internet. So if you want to connect to the internet, then you need a special service like network address translation or a proxy server. Now these services are available sometimes in routers, sometimes in proxy servers, and sometimes in firewalls. When you're ready to set up your IP network, you have to choose or acquire an IP address. Now, if you're public addressing, remember, your network ID will probably be assigned to you by your internet service provider. For example, if my internet service provider gave me a class B address like 152.77.0.0, all computers on my network, or all hosts on my network, would share the network ID 152.77, and then it would be my job as administrator to assign host IDs with the last two octets. Now in the case of private addressing, first thing I'll do is I will determine my network ID I want to use. I'll check RFC 1918. Now in RFC 1918 they say, oh, you can use the class A address 10.0.0.0 for your private network. So in this situation, all my hosts would start out with 10 as a network ID and then as administrator I would have the last three octets to hand out unique host IDs. IP addresses. Now each TCP IP device or each host or each computer needs a unique IP address, at least one unique IP address. If it has additional connections to the network it will need a unique IP address for each connection to the network. It also will need a subnet mask. Now a subnet mask is a number that accompanies the IP address and identifies which portion of the IP address is the network ID and which portion of the IP address is the host ID. The IP address and subnet mask are interrelated and each only has meaning in the context of each other. The IP address and subnet mask are the minimum addressing requirement for any TCP device. If a device has an IP address and it has a subnet mask, it will be capable of local communications. This is communicating with any other host or device on its same physical segment. Now if I want to configure my uh, computer or host for remote communication, in most cases I will want to do that, I would need to 
enter in the address of the default gateway. Now when I talk about remote communication, I'm saying that I want to connect to hosts that are on different physical segments than mine. So in order to do that, I would configure the default gateway. Now the default gateway is the IP address of the router on my same physical segment. So once I've added the IP address and subnet mask, I have local communications. I can communicate to hosts on my same physical segment. And by adding the default gateway, the IP address of the router on my segment, then I'll have remote communication and be able to potentially communicate with everyone on the network.